bless you, we just praise you, we just thank you uh, for the word. And as we have been going through the Elijah cycle between two great men who stood many times by themselves to stand in your word. May there be each man and woman here standing in the word of God in truth and declaring it, not be afraid of this day and hour we're in. So bless this word to our hearts and may it challenge us and may we stand forth. And thy word is truly a lamp unto our feet. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. 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 In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. There's an Irish cousin of mine yeah. from Ireland. Good evening. Her name is Christine Gallagher. She is now prophesying very dire days ahead. If you take her word, they're here. They are here. They are here. So um, she is prophesying. If you go Christine Gallagher, you can see some of the uh, interesting things that she's being said. She's giving a prophetic tone to things. Mm -hmm. So that's what our, our school of prophesying will be uh, talking about and how to get the word from God for our, our world. So you need to. Uh, um, tune into what the Holy Spirit's doing. But in, in that line, there are two men that needed to stand up, and they did, and usually it's not a whole crowd. Elijah would say, I and 7,000 others have not bowed the knee. So what we're going to see is, this is going all the way back in the 800s, flashpoint, as soon as these two men were done, then it breaks out what we call classical prophecy. So these two men met in a group called the School of Prophets. Remember the School of Prophets, Miss uh, Maria? Yes. The school, what were they called? The Guild, Guild Prophets. Prophets. And they came down, 1 Samuel 10, and they were using spiritual gifts. Does anyone know this, the spiritual gifts were operative back then? That, that's, that's a phenomenon most people do not know about. So now as we come to the end of the story with Elijah as far as the information that God has given us, and then we, then we get ready. So from here launches, right at the, after this is done with Elijah and Elisha, two more people, three more people, four more people start to come on the scene. Number one, how many ever heard of Amos? He had a brother called Andy. <laughs> Okay, so Amos starts to come on the line. Number two, right after this, Hosea starts to come on the line. And as far as we know, they know each other. So God is already igniting. Now, where did they start preaching? In the north. In the north, what's the north called? Israel. Israel. Then there's a third one that started coming on the scene all around the same time. Micah, Micah. Then there's a fourth one that started coming on the scene and his name, more in the south, but just over the border in the south, Jerusalem, would be Isaiah. Mm -hmm. So all of these started coming right after this time period. So is God done with prophesying? No. The school of the prophets that we're going to have is very interesting. So it'll give you a lot of background and also a practicum on how to get a word from God. Would you like to get a word from God for, the, for Vigo? Every day. I already got a word from Vigo. It doesn't look good. All right, so. Okay. And she knows it's true, amen? Ch uh, we're on 2 Kings chapter 8. Do you remember the Shunanite woman? You forgot about her already? She, she was the source of the miracles with the uh, oil, remember? You forgot about that already. Well, she's back on the scene. And we have follow-up now. So we're going to go through Alicia with her. And then, we'll, then I want to show you something very interesting. Um, and then we'll go into uh, a new topic. So, in fact, if you want to do the, uh, if you want to do the School of Prophets here or whatever, just to show you, because you don't, you, 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 you we're going to suggest things you're doing you've never done or never been told to do. You know what that is? Did you ever prophesy over your family? No. no. Did you ever prophesy over Noah? Yes. Did you ever prophesy over Joe's golf game? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> every day and every day. 
2 Kings chapter, chapter 8, verse 1. Everybody with me? Say amen. Amen. Elisha said to the woman whose son he had restored to life. Remember, he, he, uh, he was born and then he got a headache and he laid upon them. Okay, please don't think anything bad about that one. Okay. So he laid upon them and, and he breathed like a, a lifeguard breath into him. Okay, now if, if you underline the first one that he had restored to life, arise. Everybody say arise. Arise. How do you say arise? Kum. Okay, now, when, when Jesus spoke Aramaic, this is not yet the time when Aramaic breaks forth in Israel. Aramaic breaks forth about a century after this. It breaks forth in the, in the year 721 B.C. The north came down Syria, or Aram, you ever hear Aram? <coughs> it came down and attacked in the northern part of Israel. And then when it came to Sam Samaria, the Japanese version, Samaria. <laughs> and, and we've been talking a lot about Samaria last uh, week, haven't we? When it came in, guess what happens? It took over and it made them uh, captives and it made them speak their language. So that's why Jesus speaks Aramaic. And if you read the Gospel of Mark, in all of our Bibles, there is the language of Aramaic. Does everybody know that? Mm -hmm. You got four sentences in Aramaic. Everybody know them all? Talitha kume, my little lamb, get up. Eloi, 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 And by the way, they were saying, what, what's he saying up there? And uh, they thought he's calling down Elijah. And in, in the strictest of Aramaic, it means this is my destiny to be on the cross. Thirdly, Ephatha. Fourthly, what's number four? You got Abba, right? So the, these are the words, they're found in the Gospel of Mark. Hello. What, what have we been doing? Remember, we've been showing the connection here. So if you circle the word come, it's the, the power to really rise from the dead. Amen? Amen? So maybe you should look at people sitting on the couch watching TV. Kum. <laughs> Kum. <laughs> when you see Joseph there, you say, Kum. <laughs> when you see your UPS drivers, Kum. <laughs> All right. So within the word Kum, it's a very powerful expression to get off your fat walk. <laughs> <laughs> Depart with your household uh, and sojourn where you can. For the Lord has called for a famine. Now, when God's upset with us, there are famines. A famine is a sub sign for a greater sign to come. When you look at Matthew 24, remember the five signs of the second coming. I must have given them out about a thousand times already. And the, a sub-sign is famines. When God's upset with us, uh, and God, one of the kids says, does God get upset? I said, yes, <laughs> he does. Um, I said, then I said in the same breath, no matter what you do though, he still loves you equally as if you didn't sin, the, the sin that you sinned. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> so uh, he still equally loves you, so he, his love does not change because you and I have sinned. How many think you just heard good news? So now comes a famine. Now everybody remember the attacks from, uh, that heaven allows on us when we're in bad straits. War. Pestilence. Famine. And I had a fourth one. Animals that attack you in a, a lady's house. Oh. <laughs> okay, there are there are animals uh, there are animals that when a city is destroyed, for example, say there was a house in your neighborhood and nobody was in it for about thirty years. What would you find in there? Okay, you'll find a snake coming out at you. <laughs> Today I had a big turtle, like really. In the basement? No, on the street. My neighbor and I had a shoe. So um, you have the attack of the animals. Those are the four signs 
that God is displeased with us. Wait, war, pestilence, animals. War, pestilence, famine, 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 famine animals. animals. You know, you know, another word for pestilence is bugs. Yeah. <laughs> now, when you have when you have this attack of famine, something big is coming. You know, when I just saw Phoenix couldn't get out of Dallas. He shouldn't go there. He just keeps going down there for his three and a half hour flight or whatever down there. And, uh, you know, nobody has said this. I, I think God is allowing these things to happen. We need to get on our face and pray. Mm -hmm. yes. And with all these hurricanes and uh, twisters and everything else, nobody's saying, oh, it's just normal. And then they do the climate change. Okay. I mean, is that a great answer? No. <laughs> you know what the great answer is? Get on your face to the one who controls that. Who's responsible for the climate change? That's right. So it is climate change causes... All right. So discussions. Next Bible study is climate change for real. <laughs> so if you underline it, here comes the famine. And we see famines throughout the Bible. So you know that God's upset and something's coming. And when, when we do this school of, you're going to learn this, Sister Vigo, when we do this school of prophecy, you're going to learn how to prophesy over people. You're going to learn how to stand up one against a thousand. This is really going to be good. I can't wait to hear this myself. This is going to be good. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So, uh, verse number, verse number one man, verse number two. And it will come upon the land for seven years. Does that, does that look seven years? What does that remind you of? Seven years was Joseph in the Old Testament. Remember, there was going to be a famine for seven years and then plenty for plenty. Now, when something happens, when God says a word that's going to happen, it just doesn't come, boom, it happens. It falls on you. It's gradual. So, when Joseph was in Egypt, it just didn't go, boom, like there's no food. There was food. Shopping was still open. <laughs> But guess what happened to ShopRite? They didn't get supplies to... Uh, everything was starting to empty the shelf. Sister uh, Marilyn, I, I was with her um, on Sunday, and uh, she said they, um, there's a lot of civil unrest in Haiti right now. And when they drive, the, uh, drive through streets, sometimes they're met with a machine gun in their face. If you want to go to the rest of the road, give us some money. Wow. And so they would go in, and the kids, the kids, they, the kids needed to eat. So, of course, what do you do when you have no food? You eat the dirt. You pray. And being a nun, what do you learn to do? Pray. And there, everything was bare empty, and they just saw a man off to the side, and he had a cover over like a couple wheelbarrows, and they said, um, "What's in there?" They said, "Bread. We gonna can we buy some?" So she's taken all the money that we sent her and she bought bread for all the kids. And they said on Christmas, there were 200 kids came to Christmas dinner. And they're little skinny guys, of course. You don't see any fat uh, Haitians down there. If there's a fat Haitian, you'd be suspect, okay? Okay. So um, they said the kids on Christmas never ate so fast rice and chicken. Wow. And they downed, they went, <laughs> little, little skinny jobs, they just went, what? Okay? So, uh, underline there's seven years. Verse two, ma'am. Thank you. So the woman arose. Now, what is, what, what is the whole idea of kum and arising again? This is the very sense when you read Mark's gospel that Jesus is going to say rise. Now, what word is he going to use in Mark's gospel? Remember there was a little girl? And what's he going to say? Talitha kume. Now, what does kume mean? K O U M I. Arise. You got it? K O U M I. You got it? Talitha. Now, most people don't know what Jesus is doing. She's on a bed, a little one, probably on the floor. Jesus is wearing his talit. What's a talit? Prayer shawl. She probably just is about 12 years old and she made her bat mitzvah. As a girl, it's bat. What is she wrapped in? She's wrapped in a talit. 
She's wrapped in her prayer shawl. So Jesus walks in, and at the bottom of his feet there, there are four blue tied up in strings. Blue, which means obedience to the Father. He walks in with his prayer shawl, touches the bed where she is. He's wearing his talit. She's wrapped in a talit. Are you getting this? How many things this is beautiful? Oh, yeah. And then all of a sudden he says, Talitha ko. Mm-hmm. Do you see the background now? And then the literal translation from the Aramaic is my little lamb. My little lamb come to me. And so she wakes up and then she starts singing, there you are, standing there loving me. Is that beautiful or what? Yes. Yes. Amen. I, I brought it right up. Into, I brought it right up into a modern sense for you. Yes. Okay. So that's that's Talitha Kum. And so we can see this now again connecting to the Gospel of Mark. So we're we're, we're getting through a, a, an, an understanding. Verse two, ma'am. And did according to the word of the man of God, the Ish Elohim. She went with her household and sojourned in the land of the Philistines seven years. Now, what's the land of the Philistines? If she's in Shunem, how many ever heard of Nazareth? She's up north. She's right over here across the valley of Armageddon. Here's Nazareth. Here's Shunem. Did you ever go to Nazareth, madam? Yes, I did. And then all of a sudden, we got to get out of here. What's right in front of them? Armageddon. Why do I keep saying Armageddon? Because Armageddon is lush, isn't it? Isn't it beautiful? When we went up on the Mount Tabor, did you ever see that with your B&H? Okay, I haven't seen the pictures yet. But, uh, and so, it's, very, it's, it's a very lush field at the end of time. And then what does she have to, she, so she, she's in Shunem, the Shunemite, and what does she have to do? She has to, Get out of here and go to the coast. On the coast is the land of the Philistines. And who is in the land of the Philistines? Goliath. Goliath. Remember him? Yep. Mm-hmm. And by the way, you might have heard of that in, the, in your, your history lessons today. The Gaza Strip. Yeah. All of that in there. Amen. And uh, by the way, at this very moment, Iran is preparing to attack Israel. Yeah. So that's nothing new in Europe. Yeah. Yeah. They're getting ready for an all-out war at this very minute. Where so good thing you enjoyed your trip there. All right, so now, so now watch what happens. In the ministry of Jesus, he starts from the north and he starts traveling down the land. When he comes to Jerusalem, he's visiting all the prophets. Did you see that? So let's see what happens to her. She's out of town there. Verse 3, ma'am. Thank you. And at the end of the seven years, when the woman returned to the land of the Philistines, she went forth to appeal the king for her household and her land. Of course, she needs things. Verse 4, here she goes again. Now the king was talking with Gehazi. Remember Gehazi? Yes. He was that um, servant of Elisha who said, let's get, let's get some bucks off of this guy. He's got bucks. Maybe he can donate it to the church. You know, remember him? And then he, he, was, he was on the outs, wasn't he? So verse number four. Tell me all the great things that Elisha has done. Okay, now, go with me to chapter seven of Luke. Hold your spot. We'll be right back. Let's see the connection. Luke said right in the beginning there, around verse what, 11, 12, 17. Um, and when Jesus raises the dead man in Nain, what did they say? He has what? See that expression? He has done it. You see it? Luke 7, 11. Yeah, see 11? What does it say? He went into the city called Nain. Go ahead. Now go to the end of the story. 
After he raises him, and what, remember verse 17, what does he say? A great prophet has risen in the young man I see. Go ahead. And he, uh, so there's the prophet arising in the midst. So now what are you supposed to think when you hear that? You've got to think of Elisha. And what do they say about Jesus when he does things? He does things well. How do you say well in Greek? Eulogy. You ever hear of a eulogy? Here, here's how you spell it if you're interested in Greek. E. U L O G E O. So when you're giving a eulogy, the guy, the gal that's dead, you gotta say something nice about them. <laughs> and they can't come back at you, so if you wanna really give it to them, then go ahead. Amen? So that's where we get the word eulogy from. But notice that when, when Jesus does this, where are we at a funeral? What do they say? A prophet has what? Risen. Risen. Everybody right in there. Elisha. So what are they saying? He's the new Elisha. He's got the same power. Now, did Elisha bring people back from the dead? Yes. yes. What's the town? Shunem. Nain is right by Shunem. Did you see Shunem with your B&H? I should have taken you there. And so we got Shunem right next door, and all of a sudden, guess what happens? He's visiting and doing what these prophets did. Amen? Are you getting this? So what is Jesus doing? Jesus, when he tours Israel, he comes down to major spots in the Bible where things happened. So when they're saying that he did this well, or a prophet is in our midst, that's, they're saying, they're back. You, you, you got the connection now? So when we study this and that connection, you see, Mark, that's the message. Now, in the end of time, in Revelation 11, they're going to be, the two prophets are, you know, with Arnold, they're back. <laughs> Revelation 11, Moses is coming back. And Elijah is coming back, or Mary at La Salette says, you know, Mary prophesied this. Did you know Mary prophesied at La Salette? Did you study La Salette? So when we do the school of prophecy, we're going to look at a lot of prophecies. Mary says, I, I, I got to go with Mary if she says it. She told these little kids in France, it's right by Vigo, it's not too far from Vigo. I, I wish Mary would have gone over the hill into Vigo and visited those people there. And she said to them, the, the, when the two prophets of Revelation come, I can't believe Mary said this, the other man is Enoch. Mm. Yes. You, you, can go on, you can go online and you can read Mary's prophecy. Mary was in the school of prophecy. Did you know that, Senora? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. She was okay, good stuff. Yes! This is from a previous Bible study. A previous Bible study. Another prophet, Moses. Sir, 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 That's what they're waiting for. This is the realization of what Moses said. Yes. Where's that in the Bible? Moses 1 1. Deuteronomy 18 15. And, and, and the Gospel of John, in the Gospel of John, they say a prophet is in our midst. What are they referring to? Deuteronomy 18 15. Because one like Moses is coming. Amen? Amen. Are, are you getting all this connection? Yeah. Are back with me, ma'am. Thank you. To 2 Kings 8. Um, so if you underline there, verse 4, ma'am. Thank you. We're in verse 5 now, ma'am. Thank you. And he was telling the king how Elisha had restored the dead to life. Now, underline that. Do you think that was brand new back then? Yes. yes. Now, in Matthew chapter 10, I told you that Jesus said, you shall raise the dead. I, now, if we went around the room, how many people prayed with the dead and they came alive? Say, so they live with me. <laughs> <laughs> They're in this room. They're in this room now. 
we got to pump them with oxygen or something. But here now is the physical dead. And prior to this, if you underline it right there, nobody has ever come back from the dead. And so I, I told you my story, you've heard it a hundred times. I said, Lord, I've seen everything happen. The, the worst diseases and people being healed. But I said, I didn't do a one, I didn't say one from the dead. And during my preaching, somebody dropped dead. How many know that made me feel very bad? I never preached and they dropped on me. So I, I, it's, it's Tony's son. And he was in church here. On, on, so he's still alive. So he dropped dead. Oh, Bowen, were you in the church? He dropped dead. And I said, I don't think I should continue with this sermon. <laughs> he dropped dead. I went up and I said, look you. You didn't hear the rest of the sermon. Now wake up and hear the rest. So he, he, he came back from the dead. And he went to the university hospital in Newark. And the doctor said, how? Are you alive? You should be morta, morta, morta. So if you underline that expression there, every see it from, that's the first time we have somebody. Now, here's, here's the difference with Jesus. Jesus brings people, um, and you get your same body back. Okay, so that's arising from the dead. Now, how many times did Jesus, as we know, bring people back from the dead? Now, it's interesting when he brings the people back from the dead. It's, excuse me, I got progressive glasses on. It's progressive. Or it sounds like the insurance. Oh, good. Amen. Yeah. Number one, he brings people back who have died. So it was instant. Talitha kum. In the Gospel of Mark. Then he brings people back who have died within a few hours. That's Nain. Then he brings somebody back from the dead when it's four days. Do you see the progression? Just died, being carried out in death, and dead for four days, and buried. So now if, you, if she, the little girl just died, you say, that doesn't seem like to be a miracle, because she was, probably wasn't dead to begin with. Because remember there was discussion? He's sleeping. Number two, it, he was dead. They're boo-hooing. And Pe Peter with his B&H camera from the bus. And so they were being buried. And they said, I wanted to go in and walk on the ground. They said, inside it's just an empty church with a picture of that there. And thirdly, thirdly the third thing is, he was really dead for four days. So now... In John eleven twenty five, Jesus is the what? He says, I'm the resurrection. So every time somebody, those three were raised from the dead, they got their own bodies back. How many think your body had a little bit of a kink in it? A few. Okay. How many think you got a little kick in your body after that? Amen. So what happened is they got a rest restored, resuscitated body. But that's called bringing back the dead to life. But Jesus says these words, I'm the resurrection and the life. Whoever dies believing me, John 11, 25, what happens then? It's a brand new body. You see the difference? You see the brand new difference between having a brand new... Now, how can the Jewish people do not believe in the resurrection of Jesus? Do they believe in the resurrection? Yes. Why don't they believe that after Jesus rose from the dead? Why don't they believe? Because here's what they tell me. They believe in the 200s AD, there was a man called Judah the Prince, and he rose from the dead too. Do I believe that? No. no. Okay? But that's what's circulating among them, that Jesus is not the one who rose from the dead, because if he did, both well, Judah did it too. All right, so I think... So, did you underline that there? Now tell me, look at, look at verse 4, tell me the great things. Now what's the greatest thing that could happen? I'm glad God showed me that miracle, that that guy, I don't think it was my preaching to you. And he was telling the king that Elisha to restore the dead to life. Underline that please. Look at verse 5, ma'am. 
Behold, the woman whose son had restored to life appealed to the king. So now he's getting he's getting some uh, the kids in there for the, her household and her land because she needs something to eat. And Gehazi said, My lord, O king, here is the woman, here is the son whom Elijah restored. So now guess what happens? This is called power evangelism. This is the first time we have what is called power evangelism. Now in the Old Testament, there are very few evangelists. Who's one of the most famous evangelists in the Old Testament? Ready? John the Baptist. Oh, no, Old Testament. Old Testament. Yeah, all right, well, we, that is correct. Um, Samuel. You ever hear Samuel? He would, in 1 Kings 8, he would go from town to town, and he'd be evangelizing. Do the Jews evangelize? Very little. Very, very little. Do they? Yes, but it's very, very, very little. They are not interested in building up Judaism and having more people come in. Really? No. Why? It, it's because it's, it's a family affair, sister. That's right. So what do we? How, how do I? How do I get my religion to increase? Go have babies. Now, believe it or not, Catholics were never good evangelists. <laughs> and so what, what do we do what do we, we have good teaching on having babies right so that's and by the way the Muslims are not good at evangelizing they might put a pistol in you and say evangelize or die <laughs> that's what they do in many cases amen 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 so and what do, what do the Muslims do have babies and that's why Europe, if, if we're around in 2050, how I many of most of us will be gone by 2050? I'm looking at some of you. Liz Kanapka is going to bury a lot of people in here. A lot of people. Go, Liz, go. My Lord, O oh King, uh, uh, verse, uh, verse 6, ma'am. Verse 6, ma'am. And the king asked the woman, she told him, so the king appointed an official for her, saying, We stole all that was hers. Now, when you follow God and suffer, anybody suffer a little bit? But you're still faithful to God. Anybody still faithful to God? Uh, so God, I don't understand why this is happening. A circle the word restoration. It's the Job story. You see the Job story? If you stay faithful to God in season and out of season, and you're going through hard times, you're going through a hell of a time with your family, Everything's breaking down. You don't know what you're doing. You're staying faithful. Circle the word. This is called biblical restoration. And let me tell you something. Your life's going to be blessed. Amen? Amen. How, how, many, how many like that word tonight? Are, are, are you getting happy now? Here's another promise. I'll give you another promise. There's, there's, a, there's a word in Joel 1. It says the grasshopper has eaten your, your life up. How many look at your life and say, I got a raw deal. Nobody's there yet? You want to hear my story? <laughs> no, no. Just say no. All right, so, so when, the, when the grasshopper eats everything up and you stay faithful to God, you're going to have what? Restoration. And that's uh, Job 38, 39, 40, 41, 42. How many of you know you just heard more good news? You understand restoration? That God is going, because of my faithfulness to God, I am going to see it back. Amen? Now, of course, I would like a little chingy chingy or a little restoration here, but that's not the focus. It's in eternal life, isn't it? Amen? Good stuff? So if you underline that there, verse number six, ma'am. Six. Good stuff? We stole all that was hers together with all the produce of the fields from the day she left the land until now. So what did she go? Remember, uh, uh, Alicia knocked on the door and said, by the way, uh, I need your last meal. Yeah, what about me? What do you mean, you my, my last meal? She gave it to him. The kid was restored. Things went back a few years later. He had a hemorrhage in the head. He died. He brought it back to life, raised the dead. And all of a sudden now, more famine, moving out, moving back in. She's got her, all her fields are back. See what happens when you stay faithful to God. Of course, here's the pain. Do I got to wait that long? Amen. Restoration means that I do better wait. Amen. Restoration means I do better wait. I'm in verse 7, ma'am. Then Elisha came to Damascus. Ooh, where are we? 
We're in the realm, right? We're in Damascus where? Syria. We're in Syria. Wow. I, I, I stood with Irma. Irma was a wild person on the very corner of Israel. And we, Paul, Paul did walk 40 miles there. It's 40 miles from northern Israel. How many remember Jesus saying there were Peter upon this rock? It's 40 miles from there. So he walked 40 miles. How long would it take him to walk to Damascus? Oh, about two weeks. Every every week you do a every week you uh, Avon does around her. She would do it in a day. But uh, wait a minute. Um, when I go backpacking, I do 100 miles in 12 days. Okay, so Avon would have been in Athens, Greece, by that time. <laughs> <laughs> when I go backpacking, I pack with five pounds. I'm going to eight to ten miles. So he so maximally. Uh, Maximally, or minimum, yeah, maximally, it would have taken you, if you want to do 20 miles, it would be about a week. So when Mary and Joseph were coming from Nazareth down to Bethlehem, how many miles was it? About 95. Wow. So when they got the word from Caesar Augustus that you got to go to Bethlehem, oh yeah, right, I'm pregnant. So how long would it take them to go down? Maybe because they were young, five or six days. Now every time I look at uh, Our Lady Guadalupe picture, do you know how old Mary is in that picture? 18, 19 years old. Wow. Really? Mm -hmm. And she's pregnant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they had, they had a miraculous image, and they had a stethoscope, and you could hear a baby's heart inside of it. Yes, I did too. Yeah. Wow, I said, this is amazing. They don't show that at UPS. All right, verse 7. Everybody got the picture of restoration? Yes. Everybody see the dead to life? Everybody see the connection in the Gospel of Mark and Luke? Everybody see that? Interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Verse 7 minute. Thank you. Now, Elisha came to Damascus. Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, was sick. Of course, what do they want when they hear about one story? Now, do these stories stay local? Yeah. No, they travel. I had one lady called me up, and she says, Hi, Father Bill. Well, hello to you. And she says, I live in Seattle, Washington. Um, my daughter is sick. Would you, would you come here and lay hands on her? Um, there's only one problem. You are not next door to me. She said, I will fly you out. Wow. I said, why don't you come out here? She said, no. I, I'm afraid to fly. Mm. Oh, so you want me to die on the way to see her? <laughs> <laughs> Father, she's listening. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So, and when it was told him, the man of God has come here, verse 8 man, the king said to Hazael, take a present with you and go to meet the man of God. Now, if you underline there, take a present, because you can never come into the, the point of holiness empty-handed. In the book of Revelation 21, how many ever heard of the We three kings of Orient Scooby Doo Bee Boo Bee Boo? Do you ever hear that? Yes. They knew they could not come into holiness empty handed. And when you go into church, you cannot come in empty handed, but many people are empty handed. You've got to come with a heart filled with expectation and anticipation because you're going to leave emptier than you can if you come in and just sit there. Duh. Where's Canada? Next to Sea Caucus. <laughs> so, if you underline that, Revelation 21, when you come in to see God, you've got to never come empty handed. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Now, when the Lord says, Miss Pat, front and center, do you think she's going to bring her dying stuff? Yes. <laughs> uh, it doesn't look good. <laughs> Do you think Peter's going to bring his finger wrap with him? <laughs> Take a present with you, verse 8, ma'am. Go to meet the man of God and inquire the Lord, saying, Shall I recover from this sickness? How many know when you get sick, you think about dying? Mm -hmm. I, I, I was talking to a friend on the phone yesterday, yesterday, and she says, You know, I'm looking at my life. I don't got long to live. I said, I'll do your funeral. I learned it from my family. 
<laughs> First time, ma'am. So Hazalel, how many ever heard this story before? That's what I thought you were going to say. So Hazalel went to meet him and took a present with him, all kinds of goods at Damascus, 40 camel loads, wow. dromedaries. Can you imagine? Can you imagine having all these big galoops walking in? Good loop, good loop, good loop. Okay. Irma was on top of them. They have the biggest, yellowest teeth you've ever want to see. And let me tell you something. If it's one hump, it's a dromedary. And let me tell you something. If you get a one humper, they run real fast. And uh, one guy wanted to marry Irma, so he said to the dromedary, run real fast and I'll meet, me, meet me in the cave. So all of a sudden you see Irma taking off through Jerusalem. Oh, and all the way. And, he's, and he says to Irma, he says, well, he says, look, marry me and you'll be the only one. Yeah. <laughs> okay, because I don't have a blonde in my... Uh, 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 Oh, man. I, I mean, if anybody's blind and going to the Holy Land, you can get married. Go into the chapel and... All right. Interesting. Amen? So, uh, 40 camelos. Do you think that's a lot? Yeah. When he came and stood before me, he said, Your son ben a king, has sent me to you, saying, Shall I recover from the sickness? Now, if you go back with me to... Um, if you were to look at the beginning of 2 Kings 1, it sounds like this already is, uh, is like deja vu. Your son ben Hadad, king of Syria, has come to you saying, Shall I recover from the sickness? Verse 10, ma'am. Thank you. And Elisha said to him, Go, say to him, You shall certainly recover. But the Lord has shown me, uh, go, Say to him, You shall certainly recover. But the Lord has shown me that he, he shall certainly die. Now, if you underline the word die, let me give you the Hebrew words. Moot the moot. <laughs> Like yes, it's like more than no. let, let me give you, let me, let me spell it for you. Moot, M-U-T. And then the moot, D-E-M-U-T. Moot the moot. That means you're really, wait a minute, tell him he's going to live, but you shall surely die. Okay, now be careful that you want to, you, you don't hear what you want to hear. Now how many, how many times is Alicia bringing people back from the dead? Let's see what happens. Elisha said to him, go to Satan in verse 10, you shall certainly recover, but the Lord has shown me he will certainly moot the moot. Everybody say moot. Now moot is death or die. The moot means you're really going to die. What they did back then in Hebrew is they repeated the word a couple of times. Verse 11, man. And he fixed his gaze and stared at him until he was ashamed. And the man of God wept. Why? You want to live, but look at your life. Now this is called in the Bible, this is very difficult to interpret, deceptive spirits. How many want to hear what you want to hear or hear what God's saying to you? Let me ask you a question. How many ever prayed and you, you thought an answer from God was coming and it didn't come? Mm -hmm. Ever happened to you? Yes. And then what do you say? I'm talking to God about this. And did you ever say you're mad at God? Yes. God can handle it. Okay? Just just do yourself a favor and be yourself. Amen? So, moot the moots. And Hazalel, look at verse, so underline there verse 11. So what does Alicia start doing? Weeping. Hello? Anybody know somebody that wept? Jeremiah. Why is he weeping? Jeremiah wept. Very good. You're getting an A, sister. Who else wept? The Lord Jesus. Why did Jesus weep? He wept twice. Now, what's happening right now? What's happening at this very minute? You got to get this. Physical death and spiritual death. Things are not going good in this area. I just got a phone call Saturday night. And someone said, my father's dying. Come on over. I said, I'll be there. And guess what happened? <laughs> I'm laughing telling you this. And some of the local churches, they said, we're not coming. I said, you're kidding. They said, we're not coming. If you want us to annoy him, bring him here. I said, he's in a bed. What are you supposed to do? Put him like a hot dog and ship him in? You know, right? right. He, he, wasn't, he wasn't our parishioner. So I'm like, so I just want you to know, things are not going good locally. This is, this is really bad out there. Amen? I have his four friends carrying on a mattress. They should have done that. Now, physical death. Lazarus. 
spiritual death, he cried again, Jerusalem. Did Jesus cry more than that? Yeah. Yes. Now, circle this right there. He cried. In Luke 19, it says, Jesus wept. Now, in John 11, it says too that it was the shortest verse in the Bible. In Greek, it's not the shortest verse. Mm -hmm. But he cried because, number one, nobody asked him to raise him from the dead. Mm -hmm. And number two, spiritually, Jerusalem was sunk. Mm -hmm. Okay, why? Because they practiced the form of religion and denied its power. So right now we're encountering, right now, mm -hmm. physical death and spiritual death. Look who's crying. What happens if you're, if you're God's man, and what happens, and this happens to me, I have people coming up for prayer, and I know they're not going to be healed. So if you see me doing this, I'm stepping away from them because their heart's not ready. See these no glasses? X-ray heart vision glasses. The Holy, the Holy Spirit has given me a sense. I can tell when they come up, they're not going to be healed. And, and, and uh, some, some of you might say, do you have that sense about me? Don't ask me. I'll, I'll say, ask Brother Peter. All right, now. Amen. So, see what happens there? Look at verse 12, ma'am. Thank you. Hazael said, why does my Lord weep? He answered, because I know the evil that he will do to the sons of Israel. If all of a sudden, Ben Hadad, I pray over you, and I say you're going to live, you will live and you will kill Israelites. Wow. Is that why I want you to die? I walked into a room, and this was Spanish, senora, senorita, you're senorita, you're still senorita, you're still jovencita. <laughs> and everybody was crying in Spanish. Did you ever see people crying in Spanish? Yeah. <laughs> crying in Spanish. And I walked in, I walked in, and I see everybody boo-hooing in Spanish. Senorita, you got the picture? Yeah. They're all crying in Spanish. And I walked in and said, she's fine. I did a Padre Pio. She's, she's okay. They looked at me like... I prayed over her, and guess what happened? She was fine. And she lived five more years. And she, and when I pray with people, they don't die of that disease. Mm. But they don't say, why don't you do the preventive one too, that they don't die of anything else. <laughs> so they only, I, I, only pray, I only pray that one over. So if you're on your deathbed, if you think I can help, say all of them. Uh, when Padre P was here, do you remember when Judy was here? I, bet I was having heart problems. Ever since he prayed over me with the glove, I don't have any. Oh, Amen. Mm -hmm. They want me in the New York Marathon in two weeks. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good stuff. Are you getting this? Uh, verse number 12, ma'am. Uh, so, you will set on fire their fortresses and you will slay their young men with the sword. Now, let's do a little connection. Do you see the, the famine and, and something else is coming? You see, you see the connection? And will slay the young men with the sword and dash into pieces their little ones and rip their children uh, with, with, with child. Now, this is the end of what is called the 800s. When you, when you go into the prophet Amos, he had a brother, Andy. In chapter 1, he speaks about ripping the children open in the womb. How many ever heard that expression, dash your foot against a stone? Here's the birth of it. You'll be thinking you're walking in God and you'll trip over stones. You see, when you want to go up and see the burning bush that God's appearing to you, the path is narrow and there's only one of you can get on that path at a time. But also, too, if you're going to see your burning bush with God, you've got to make sure the floor is covered that you won't trip. That there won't be turtles in your path. Because when you drive the car, you don't want to hear goo How many ever hit an animal before in your life? One time I hit a skunk. My car was bathed in tomato juice. And I was right by a graveyard. 
hit the skunk, and all the souls in the graveyard said, out of here. They all hit the skunk. I, didn't, I saw the resurrection that day. But, but I, forgive me, but I, I stunk it. <laughs> so if we put in there Amos chapter 1, because Amos, Amos 1, Amos 2, Amos bemoans the fact that we're not following God here. I call this the Roaring Twenties. Do you remember the Roaring dun, 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 Charleston? And you know what? I got a really, really a dumb moment. I was in Charleston once. And I walked into a hall and I'm doing a little tour and I said, oh, this is where the Charleston started. I went, duh, Charleston, Charleston. I said, I, 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 if anybody know that, the Charleston started in Charleston. Oh. Did you know something new? Amen. All right. And verse number, so if you put it there by verse 12, Amos 1, because he's bemoaning the fact that people aren't following God. Now, how many know we want God, but we don't want to follow Him? And those are the people that I say aren't going to be healed. I want to be healed. But God does something, and I don't like it, but He does it, and it's okay with me. Even though I don't like it, but it's okay with me. Yeah. Two sides of the mouth, I know. I prayed over a man, a millionaire. He came in my presence in front of other millionaires. <laughs> trying to get more money for Father Steve. <laughs> and all of a sudden, guess what happened? He came out of the wheelchair like that. Wow. wow. And he's driving the car, and he's absolutely fine. Mm -hmm. And then my Irish cousin, see, he, 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 and guess how many phone calls I got? No. no. He never said, oh, Father Vila, i got to tell you, I'm jumping around now. <laughs> <laughs> That's why the spirit stuff for every work. That's for every work. <laughs> so guess what? God can heal people, like the, the ten, and nine, nine yeah, kept going, and we can... All right, so here it is. I underline now. Verse 13, man. And Hazalel said, what is your servant who is a dog that he should do this great thing? Yeah. Right now, when you call a person a dog, did you ever hear that before? Yeah. It's in Philippians 3. Mm -hmm. How many ever heard you, dirty dog? Mm -hmm. yeah. A dog, this is such a terrible saying. The wife said You would never get two dogs in your house attacking the holy <laughs> man of God. I mean... <laughs> I only have one thing about those two. Hot dogs. <laughs> in a microwave oven. Right now. In Christian love. It's in Christian love. Now, what's, what's a dog? A dog in the Bible is something bad. Because the dogs were not pets. They would run around. And guess what the Jews did? They called us dogs. Mm -hmm. Philippians 3. Matthew 15. Right in this area, there is a woman called the Syrophoenician woman. She was living by Tyre and Sidon. Jesus went into Lebanon. They, they call that the other Israel, the other holy land. They want me to go there. She lived in Wichipu area. Mm -hmm. Who was there? You know the names again. Jezebel and Ahab, Ahab, or we would say. This is called the Omri Dynasty. Oh, and it sounds like a watch, doesn't it? O M R I Omri Dynasty. So he, here, here, here we come again. So you want to hear that they're okay, but they're gonna move the move, die. You're gonna die, baby. You're dead. You're meat. The Lord has shown me that you are to be king over Syria. Verse to 14, man. Then he departed from Elisha and came to his master and said, What did Elisha say to you? He answered, He told me that you are to certainly recover. Maybe he had a few days he felt better. Maybe he had a few days of recovery, but guess what will happen? I don't recall almost never praying over people for an illness to go where they like, ever comes back. Is that good? Isn't that really good? And uh, he certainly, but the next day, verse 15, 
He took the coverlet and dipped it in the water and spread it over his face till he died. Mm -hmm. So what would happen? He was flat out on his bed and he went and he left the area. Gone. He murdered so him, right? He might have had a few moments of yeah. feeling better. He recovered. And then he died. So he recovered. Father, did he murder him? No. No? No, no. Oh, well, no he took the cloth. It, I thought like he dipped it in water and covered his face and just suffocated him. No, I think that's the way of planting them. Yes. Ah, uh, okay, okay, okay. Got it. <laughs> okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, and he spread it over his face till he died. Yeah, you can see that. <coughs> so you could look at it that way that he recovered and then he was murdered. Oh, you could. You could look at it. Yeah. Oh. So he, he recovered. He re he recovered and then he what? Died. You got it. Was that prophecy answered? Yeah. Yeah. But it didn't say one 24 hour period and you're gone anyway. It's called, you know, that, this is short term. Short term healing. Okay, interesting. That, so there it is. So, so if you draw the connection there from verse, um, because it's kind of two faced, isn't it? But it isn't. If you go from uh, verse number 10 and draw the line all the way down to verse number 15, you see it there? Good stuff? Good stuff. Now, finally, if you switch to chapter uh, 9, I want to show you some stuff in here as we get ready to wrap up. My time goes quick, doesn't it? We, we have completed now Elijah and Elisha. Every story about both of them. Showed you, we showed you deeply the connection into the... Um, New Testament. Everybody ready? Now, I want to show you something. Turn to the person next to you. This is really amazing. This is really amazing. It's really amazing. We we have um, Maria. We have the we have the school prophets again here. I hope you're paying attention. Uh, you, how many how many got there? Twenty four. Twenty four want to go to the school of prophets. Oh, I didn't sign. Yeah. Oh wow! That's going to be here, right? Yeah, it's here. Oh, good. No. Uh, and it'll be in Maria's house with Joe, and uh, <laughs> we will be going room to room sure. and prophesying where her daughter okay. is coming. And Maria's, <laughs> and, and Maria's going to cook Italian <laughs> for us. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I want to show you how to. I want to show. I want to show us how to get prophecy and use it. And then I want to tell you something very interesting: how to start going from room to room. In Vigo and prophesy. Are you going back to Vigo anytime soon? By Christmas, you're going to Vigo? Boy, she's got a one way ticket to Vigo. Okay, everybody with me in chapter um, 9. Chapter, chapter 9, 2 Kings 9. Now, I want to show you something really, a uh, uh, reason I want to be here, I want to show you something very interesting. I got to find it first. Um, this is a precursor to Palm Sunday. That's why I want to show it to you. A precursor to Palm Sunday. Amen? Are, are, are you with me? We are. I, I think it's... Tell you what. Um, I'm trying to... I know it's in here. Uh, down to... Well, we'll, we'll start there. Um, because I want to go into the school of prophecy. Okay, so um, verse 1. Are you ready? Yes. yes. Are you getting this? Mm -hmm. Yes. How, you get how he died? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. He's going to live and then he's going to die. And we couldn't figure that out until we figured it. Verse 1. Then Elisha the prophet called out one of the sons of the prophets. Okay, now I read underline that this one of the sons of the prophets. What's this? You. The school of prophecy. prophecy. What's this called? You. The you. guild prophets. prophets. What are we starting here? The school of prophecy. prophecy. Now, in order to get a word from God, what do you got to do? Be silent. Spend, be silent and spend time. So, what's going to be part of our program already, you've got to spend time. You've got to bring a notebook that day because you're going to be writing notes from God. And it's not going to be one word. What's my love? I love. No, that is not prophesying. Mm -hmm. So, we're going to get a word from God and then we're all going to be praying and then you're going to see a miracle happen 
when all the word comes together. Are you excited about that? Yeah. And then we're going to tell you how to prophesy over Trevor and those interesting people that live with you. Amen? Amen. 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 And the ones all the way out in Phoenix. Amen? Detroit. And Detroit. Are you ready for this? Okay. And Alicia, so I'm not going to see the School of Prophets, everybody? Do you see the School of Prophets? Yes or no? Yes. yes. Now, does this look familiar? He said to him, gird your loins. How many ever heard that, gird your loins? Yeah. Right. Gird your loins. Now, what is that? Now, everybody, everybody know what it means, gird? Right, they had the albs on, right? And what did they have to do? They had to tie up their albs. Because when you're running, you got to, you can't do it or you'll trip. Amen? Are, are you going to trip? Now, I, I love the story. Father Bertolucci decided to baptize somebody in a pool. He forgot to gird. So he got up and he goes, from So the water came. You know? So it, it's important to gird. And that's in First Peter chapter 1. Gird. Gird up. Verse uh, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. Gird. Gird and take this flask of oil to your hand. Now, when you want to get out of depression, I, I've been sharing with you with Elisha. Let me show you what I mean. Anybody, anybody know anybody depressed? No. Nobody. Good. <laughs> if you go back with me to 1 Kings, just go back to a few pages. Chapter 19. Everybody with me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Go back to 19, verse 15. Anybody, anybody depressed? Mm -hmm. Alright, what's God's way of getting you out of depression? Give you a new mission. Give you something to do that will fill that mind of yours. We did yet last night. In order to be free, you got to have your mind working on all cylinders. Because you're thinking about things that you should not be thinking about. And it doesn't, it doesn't glorify God. You think about yourself? Yeah, you think about yourself all the time. What am I going to do? The past. The past. You think about the past. Mm -hmm. Or you might think about the future. That's anxiety. Mm -hmm. That's anxiety. You can't think about the past or the future. You got to live for today. And by the way, people who are anxious and they don't know how to think about today, enjoy today. It was a beautiful day, Mr. Rogers says in the neighborhood. All right, go with me, please. Is this the same Hazael? Hazael? Yeah. Yeah. Ready? Yes. Now, 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 see the connectory. All right, now go back with me to 14. Everybody with me in 14? This is just review. First Kings 19, 14. I just want to show you the connection. All right, how do you get out of depression? Was he depressed? Yes, he had a woman after him. I mean, that could depression. <laughs> so everybody, everybody with me say amen. Amen. Am I losing anybody yet? No. All right, now, verse 14. He said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of Israel, opposed for the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant. Welcome to the church today. Amen. Amen. And thrown down your altars. Okay, is that happening? Yes. 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 With the Papa Mamas or whatever else going on. Mm. And then he says there, slain your prophets with the sword. All right, now, remember who's he slain? Who is the most dangerous person in this room? The person that will use prophecy. So you're not very dangerous to anybody. They just said, I'll send a turtle in your pen. <laughs> you're dangerous when you stand up and say, thus says the Lord. <coughs> anybody, want be, anybody want to be that dangerous? Yep, they get mad. You're dangerous. They get mad. When you start, and by the way, you know why? You have to stand up in front of people and give it. Yep. I don't know if I want to go to the school of prophesying now. Mm -hmm. We're down to two. <laughs> <laughs> we just lost 22 people. <laughs> Amen. You got it? All right, now notice there, notice there, slain your prophets. 
Everybody might circle that. Who is that, everybody? Who are they killing? The school of prophets. Hello, are you getting it? Father Bill, this is not good advertising. What's that? This is not good advertising. I'm trying to scare them. You know why? Senorita Del Vigo? You know why? Because this is this is not for the faint hearted. This is for those who will say, I want to learn this. I want, I want to know how to stand up and get the Word of God. Okay? Amen? So if you don't think you can do it, stay home. Amen? This is good. How many know you're getting good stuff? Amen? Because Peter's going to have to stand up all over my walk. Now, was, was Jesus a prophet? What did he do? He had to stand up. Where did he stand up? You ever hear the Sermon on the Mount? Imagine starting preaching in front of 5,000. By the way, he didn't not preach in front of 5,000. You know how many people were there? 10. 11. Because with women and children, it said 5,000 men. And the Greek means males. So if you do your little uh, math on the Sermon on the Mount there, it's 10, 11,000. And then he did it again with the 4,000. You didn't miss the pictures. And then, then you can see, so how many, how many people did Jesus feed? 30,000 people. Wow. All right, now, everybody got the, the slain prophets there? Someone say, this is really good. This is really good. With the sword. I, even I am left. So guess what happened to a lot of, do they have, do they have a lot of prophesying going on there? Yeah. Uh, with se with, with, with 7,000, you got a lot of people standing up, but guess what they're doing? They were all killed. What did, what did Elijah have to do with the 450? If you go back to 18, but don't go there. We'll, we'll keep going backwards. Huh? What did he have to do? You have to stand up against the false word of God. And right now, I love our church like you do. And right now, what am I saying? There's some garbage going on across the across the pond. Amen. And I, we got to call a spade a spade. Amen. Amen. I love the church. I love the Holy Father. I love everything. But when when things are going well, we got to call a spade a spade. Amen. Amen. Now, what are you gonna do? Stand up. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yep. We uh, we can't be silent. Oh, How many ever heard of Cardinal Sarah or Sarah yeah. as they yeah. call it? He's saying there, he wrote a book, he wrote a book called Silence. Then he just wrote another book, It's Time to Talk. <laughs> Isn't that great? I mean, I, I, may I recommend you get both books? Jesse Romero just sent me the mail today. I just got his book on the devil in the city. He tells, he, he tells a story that he was a cop in LA, East LA. The, the Satan so took over one person, he walked into a room and the person was floating in air. Oh, wow. And then Jesse and his partner said, um, what's holding him up? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so what did they do? Here's a person floating in air and they did this. Wow. wow. Underneath to see wow. if there was, and did this and did this. No wires. no wires. He was floating in air. Wow. And what happened to his eyeballs, they went back into the white of the eyeballs. He was so taken over, and what did they start doing? Saying the rosary. And by the way, um, what we're going to do in, in two weeks is we're going to say the rosary in Latin. Because when you say it in Latin, then you break the power of evil around you. You can say it in English. Are you going to write it for us? Yes, we'll write it for you, sister. Amen. So make sure you're off from work. <laughs> they, they said the rosary with Jesse Romero. They said the rosary, and guess what happened? <laughs> now the reason why I said Latin because when it's in Latin, it's the only pure language in the world that just never been curses in. Now when you come and say it in English or in Spanish, that's fine. Say it in English, say it in Spanish, but you. But those who, you know... Oh, Father, why do you say that there have never been curses in, in Latin? Nobody's ever cursed in it. But the Romans must have. They did. 
Oh. But we didn't. Oh, right. right there was right, no right, words right. translated. Yeah. yeah, okay. See, I learned Spanish, but one thing I never did, I never cursed in Spanish. Mm. Did you ever curse in Spanish? Mm. She's not saying it. Yeah. <laughs> I, now, in English, I might have said a few words along the line in my life. Hey, Amen. Did you ever curse in Korean? Okay, she, she's, she's not she's saying anything. The fifth. You ever curse in Creole? In Haitian? He's not saying anything. All right, so, so our languages are not pure. But in Latin, in Latin we don't know any words to curse. Right. So. Okay. Interesting. That's, that's what Jesse was saying. But didn't Jesse say that the devil hates to hear the Latin? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah that's why. Mm. Right. Okay, I just want to draw this connection. Are you seeing the connection so far? No, I, I didn't get my point yet. <laughs> Verse 15. Now, remember he was depressed. Here's when he comes out of depression. Verse 15. And the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. Hello? Who, who takes up the, uh, the call? And... When you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. Did we just meet him? Yeah. Hmm. Somebody say, Briefly. Now, you shall anoint Hazael, and verse 16, 16, ma'am. Thank you. Jehu, the son of Nimshi, what names? Mm. They came from Japan. Uh, <laughs> son, son of Nimshi, you shall anoint the king over Israel. Elisha, the son of Shaphat of Abel, Machalachach, shall anoint you the prophet of your way. I said it real fast. <laughs> now, right there, you could put a little note in. Right there, at that note, if I if I wasn't clear last time, that's when the depression broke. Give me something that I can value and see the working of God. When I get something valued and the working of God, and I feel like I'm on value, there'll be no more depression. How, how many understand that? How many understands when depression... Now, if you're depressed, what should you do? Very simple. Serve somebody. Don't sit watching Wheel of Fortune. <laughs> Amen? Amen? All right, now back with me to 2 Kings. Are you getting good stuff? Yeah. Are you seeing this? Are you seeing... Now, go back with me to verse 2. Chapter 9, ma'am. Nine, verse 2. Are you there? Yes. And when you arrive there, look for Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi. Hmm. So even though, now what's, it, what's his getting out of depression? Getting out of depression is, ready for this? I'm going to prepare you to do that. Did Elijah do it? No. What did he do? He took a nice ride where John the Baptist would appear. You seeing all the connections? Now, what does he do? So, how many know that appeared in 2 Kings 9? We forgot that story, amen? Now, just to give you a little, there's no story in the Bible that doesn't bring it to completion. So guess what? Do we look for it? No, but here's the conclusion of it. Are, are you getting, getting, the, getting the factoid now? Now watch this. And then take the flask of oil, pour it on his head and say, but back then they didn't give a little dab do you? I love when Father Steve anoints a baby. He, he goes like this, he takes the oil and goes, what? <laughs> and I said, I love when Father Steve does it. Just, just let it drip, baby. Let it drip. Let him take it in. And so that baby is smelling with that oil for about 30 years. <laughs> then, the, then the flask of oil, unlike verse 3, and pour it on his head. Now this is, this is, what is he doing? Go back to verse 1. What is he? The school of? Prophecy. Now, what we're going to be doing in the school of prophecy, you're going to get a literal anointing. But you were fine, Steve. <laughs> I'm inviting Father Steve. The night before, we are going to get some Italian oil. I have my name. I have plenty of them at home. And your head, by Father Steve, is going to go, wow! <laughs> How many want the gift of anointing that your gift of prophecy come forward? Right? This is going to be a life changer. This is going all over the world, let me tell you. Amen? Amen. Okay. So Pat will be here filming first. And then he says there, pour it on his head. Now, underline pour. What does it mean? Drench. When you pour, you drench him in it. 
Is anybody getting good stuff beside me? Yeah. Then he says, look at verse 3, ma'am. 3. Thank you. Thus says the Lord, I anoint you king over Israel, then open the door and flee, do not tarry. So the young man, the prophet, who's the prophet, everybody? Mm-hmm. Elisha, went to Ramah Gilead, and when he came, behold, the commanders of the army were in council, and he said, I have an errand for you, O commander. And Jehu said, to which of us all? And he said, to you, O commander. So he arose... Verse 6, ma'am. And went into the house, and the young man poured the oil on his head, saying, Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, underline that, please, I anoint you king over the people of the Lord of Israel. Now watch this. When you got baptized, you were anointed priest, priest, prophet, prophet, and king. But guess what, everybody here, which, which I should do part two, you don't know how to reign with Christ. I want to give you seven bullet points on how to reign with Christ. Not now, but I want to give you seven bullet points. So what happens when you get the anointing? The king. Who, who's standing in his midst? The prophet. What, what's this happen? How many would like to have a gathering of people, which is everybody in this room, the anointed with the anointed. Explosion. When the anointed are with the anointed, guess what happens immediately in our midst because we're all believers in Yeshua HaMashiach. You say, we're not our hearts burning within us. And then everybody here, when you get the anointing, you're going to tell me, and I'm going to tell you, I see the Messiah. Messiah is only a word for the earth. It's not a heavenly word for Jesus. So how many would like to see the Messiah? Now when you see the Messiah, you're going to have your Emmaus walk. And you're going to walk from here all the way to Mawa. Are you getting this? How many are getting excited about that? Now underline verse 6, ma'am. I anoint, you see the anointing? How do you say that? Mashiach. That's the word for Messiah. Messiah. You got that? Uh-huh. Turn to the person next to you and say, you're anointed. <laughs> now, when you're anointed, an amazing thing happens to you. So we, we got to give you a lot of good teaching on that day. Oh, you're already getting it. When you are anointed, an amazing thing happens to you. What does it mean to be anointed? When I live my life in front of you, you see the value of my life. For example, I start to do things and you want, whoa. How many know a lot of gifted people in the church? We know of thousands, don't we? When they start doing something and they do it really well, we go, whoa, was that good? Anointing produces among the church, the body of Christ, the school of prophets. Whoa. Now, what do I want you to do when you come to the school of prophecy? I want you to hear directly from God. Want to hear? Yes. And then when God starts speaking, you know what you're going to do? Yeah. <laughs> Then there'll be little Myrta in the corner, and he'll say, yes, Myrta, what did the Lord say? And she'll say something to us, and we'll go, whoa. And Avon will say, I didn't think anything could come out of her. (laughs) And then all of a sudden, when the anointing falls, your life changes. Whoa. Do you see all this anointing going on? An anointed man gets another man who's anointed. Are you getting all this? I'm just getting it. I'm ready to do the happy dance. Amen? Are you getting this? Now, I, I just want to show you something. Well, I, I don't want to rush it. But um, uh, I just want to show you where we'll be heading. I, um, I don't want to rush it, so I won't rush it. Verse 13, um, for next week, just a commercial. Um, verse 13 is the uh, Palm Sunday. Oh.
when you study, when you read, when Palm Sunday comes up, there it is right there. Just, just to give you a little commercial for next week. Oh, wow. You see it there? Uh -huh. How many of you are the only one on your block that knows where that is? Oh, wow. So what does the anointing do? It produces Christ coming in your midst. And so what's going to happen to us in that school of prophecy that you're, you're going to go like, and you know what's going to happen to your arm? It's called in Spanish, escalafrios. Goosebumps in English. Yes. How, how many like what you just heard? How many ever saw this before? Brother Peter, did you get this? They said the last the anointing means. The anointing, the, the Hebrew word, again, is. You probably saw it on the Passion of the Christ, Mashiach. Mm -hmm. You hear them, you hear them when they get really mad, Mashiach. Can you spell that, please? I figured you would say that. <laughs> Alright, let me see what Sister taught me. Click your heels together. Mashiach. M. A. S. H. I. A. C. H. Mashiach. When they saw Jesus, someone would say, Do you think he's the Mashiach? The Jews at this very moment are waiting for the Mashiach to come. The Messiah. Now remember, it's an earthly word for God and His power. So we're going to continue there with unbelievable teaching on getting the anointing. The anointing on your lives that will never change. And then I'm, I'm going to bring tons of oil. I'll ask Father Steve to come. We're going, we're going to check the sale for Italian oil, virgin oil. I want to get you pure virgin oil. Extra virgin oil. And in the School of Prophets, if you'd like to bring oil on that day. Yeah, I'm going to say bring oil. Okay, so if you're coming. So, do we got a date already? The Saturday before? Um, oh, you want the 7th? Yes. All right. Oh, Maria, did you say it's the 7th? December 7th. Are you inviting others or just us? Okay, good stuff. We're going we're to get a lot of teaching on um, how to prophesy over your family. Did you ever prophesy over your family? Did you ever prophesy over Noah? Did you ever prophesy over Stanley? Heavenly Father, we just ask your blessings upon this great word that we received. It, wasn't it an unusual word tonight? It didn't follow the norm of everything you knew. How many learned new things tonight beside me? <laughs> Father, we just ask your blessing on this fresh manna word and help us to walk in the power of the new anointing of God. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Next week, I'm going to take you right into the New Testament and show you something absolutely remarkable.